Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Are you ready to get in the Word tonight? Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to get on my knees and pray, and then we'll um, get ready. Father, thank you for tonight. We're so grateful that any time we can come together, Lord, that we can call on your name. And Lord, tonight it's not about a young man or an old man any, uh, or a woman, anything like that. Lord, it's about your Holy Spirit that come and speak to us. So come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this house. Just have your way in each and every one of our hearts, I pray, that you prepare our hearts that you'll help us, Lord, to really get the word that is sown tonight, that the seed will bring forth much fruit in every heart. I pray for that, Father. No distractions, nothing to hold us back so that we can walk out of here, each and every one of us, different, changed, touched by your presence and by your word. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory for it all. And everybody in agreement say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So, um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take turns and maybe we jump into each other's uh, notes here every now and then. But I think I'm going to have my wonderful wife uh, that has put up with me for all these years. I'll give her the honor of starting us out and then I will. That's come so up sweet to of that. you, trying to get some points. I'm trying. I'm trying, baby. Good. Make note, I'm trying. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, you know, um, I think back of our life of 31 years together. Never did I think in my wildest dreams that I would have the honor to stand in front of you and talk about marriage. Be able to share with you the lessons we've learned about marriage because there have been some times in our lives that, that were pretty dark. There have been some times in our lives that we've gone through a lot of change, we've gone through a lot of pain, and we were very well equipped to hurt one another when we first enter into marriage as a Christian couple, as believers and all of that, somehow we were not well prepared. And uh, we have an amazing life right now. We are truly, I am more in love with this man than the day I married him. He has become a part of me that I cannot even imagine being without my best friend. He knows me and it is just such a blessing. But you know, marriage is, are in trouble in this country. Marriages are in trouble all over the world. We know the statistics as 50%, just about 50% of all marriages in the United States end in divorce. We could have been one of those statistics. We're not standing here in front of you because we are all that. We're standing here telling you if it was not for the grace of God, if, if it was not for the word of God, if it was not for us, just go bow low before the Lord and plead with God to teach us and to help us. We surely would have been one of those statistics. Sad to think also, did you know that 50% of kids in the United States today will experience a divorce in their homes? their parents and of those children half of those will experience it for a second time so there is nothing good you know to be said about this the statistics look horrible but we have the answer in God's Word and we want to share with you some things that we have gone through and when it's it's my turn I would like to tell you for me as a wife for me as a woman what was my biggest struggle and thinking back I really struggled with my role. What was my role in my marriage? I grew up in the 60s. Now you know the women's lip movement was, was in full action then. We got married in the 80s. In the 80s, it's probably a time in history with one of the biggest gender role changes that went on during that time. As a young person in the church, I cannot remember, remember, even growing up in a spiritual church, do you know, I cannot remember, maybe they were, but I cannot remember of a single message that explained and taught us from scripture how to be a husband and how to be a wife. All I knew in the church back then, the only thing I ever heard and I knew was wives submit to your husbands. That's basically the extent of my teaching about what scripture says about marriage. And then I knew in my heart of hearts there was something was missing. That cannot possibly be 
the, the whole picture. Because now I get married to this man I love so much, and now I'm having problems. I'm having trouble to submit. I don't know what it should feel like. I don't know how I should do. I should just zip my lips. I should just serve. I should just disappear, you know, blend in the background. And I was not too good at doing that. Have I ever told you I'm sorry? No. Um, you know, and that is that I knew there was something missing, that that was not the whole picture. But when I looked at the world, that was not an option for me either. Because in the world at the time was, you know, women, you just go after, go after, go after your rights and all that. That was not an option for me either. So I needed some serious help. So God took me to the scripture in Ephesians that all of us know so well, Ephesians scripture that says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then husband in verse uh, Ephesians 5.25 says, husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Now my business was to do the submission part, right? Now I looked at this scripture and I s thought by myself, well, I, I just saw, do you see my Bible here? It's worn out in this scripture, in this book, in Ephesians. You know, for good reason. <laughs> so I looked at it and I thought, wow, why did Paul tell women to submit and men to love? Does that now mean that I don't have to love and he doesn't have to submit? That was the logic that I was struggling with. See that? Have you ever thought about that? Why did he tell women, submit and men love? If that was the only thing we were to do, that would mean that I didn't have to love my husband and he didn't have to submit to me. Now, I knew that I was called to love, so that's not true either because the Bible is clear that we need to love one another. It includes our spouse. So in John 13, the Bible says, a new command I give you that you love one another. And there's no option. We have to love one another. But just look at the scripture in Ephesians 5.22. The verse right before it says, wives submit, says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So here it's clear to me now that it goes both ways. Now still the question is, why did Paul now pick that one thing to tell women and that one thing to tell men? Um, here is my resolution to this. First of all, I believe it is because we are the picture of the body of Christ. If you read the whole chapter of Ephesians, the picture that we need to be together is when we come together, we need to show the world the picture of Christ. The Bible says that in Ephesians. It's the analogy of the body of Christ to a husband and wife together. So when we do this, when we submit and when we love, we see how Christ is over the church and Christ loved the church and this church submit to him. Yet, that was not enough for me. I knew there had to be more until it exploded in my head one day that, wow, I think that is the areas that we have the hardest time with. I had a very hard time with submitting and women, we hide it very well, but the truth is we are stubborn. Women are stubborn, and I'm gonna show you why. There's even a very good a picture I can give you why. And men, why did Paul say men love as Christ loved the church? Because fundamentally, you know, in a, a non-spirit controlled, 100% non-spirit controlled state, men are fundamentally selfish. Now, I would like to say, that I don't think men have a uh, problem submitting. I don't know if you will agree with me about that. Here's the condition though. When men's husbands' needs are met, they don't have a whole list of needs. There are few fundamental needs in a man's life. If those needs are met, he is at peace with the world. He's not into the detail. He's not into the going on and on. When certain needs are met, Submission is not even in a man's mind for the most part. It's like I have my needs met, I'm cool, do whatever else you want to do. But not the girls, oh my goodness, that is tough. Once a girl has made up her mind, we are so stuck in it. Hallelujah. And yes, yes. <laughs> and I don't believe Paul had to tell women to love your husbands because it's not really a problem for us. A woman is desperate for love. She's looking for love. A woman wants to love. She wants to find somebody that she can just love. A woman doesn't say, I want to get married so I can submit to somebody. No. 
A woman says, I want to get married. I want to find somebody that I can love. So I have a picture here to show you where this all starts. The trouble starts in the brain. So I have a picture of a brain. Okay. That's actually brain matters. And pun is intended in there. Okay. So most men are left brain. I know some women who call their middle name for their husbands. It is Henny Left Brain Becker, you know, or Eleanor Right Brain. We're so fit that. Now this fits, and gender-wise, 80% of you. So if you're a guy and you're over on that side, you're fine. It's okay. You can breathe deep and relax. Or if you're a woman and you're on the left brain side, that's also normal in 20% of the time. But for the most part, men are left brainers and women are right brainers. Now, just in looking at that, you can already tell. There is the source, it's just how God created us to be. A man functions mostly in an analytical way, in a scientific, in a controlled way, in a, in a systematic way. And then, of course, you have a little bit of both, but, but dominantly. And women, for the most part, function on the feel side, the passion, the yearning. Listen, a, a, a woman's brain is like a ball of wire. Just imagine wire. Spaghetti. I, I'll get through the spaghetti, but let me okay. just, yeah. A, a ball of live wire that's live, that's electricity running into it, and everything touches everything, okay? Or... A spaghetti. I've got pictures up there of a bowl of spaghetti. Uh, Here yeah. is why it is hard for a woman to change, uh, to submit, I want to say. We can change our mind easily because everything touches everything. But can you now imagine if, that, if you as a guy now want to come along and you want to fix us. Can you fix that spaghetti? It's, forget it's, it. Forget it, yeah. And have you tried? You surely have tried, but oh, yeah. because you want me to fit on the other side. But can you imagine why we are so stubborn? It's really hard for us. It's hard to pull out one piece of spaghetti and nothing else get messed up. See? Everything touches everything. So it's really hard for a woman. It's, no, this is the way it should be because the cat of the neighbors are going to benefit by it and the kids at the soccer game and my mother-in-law and everything touches everything. And the guys go, it doesn't even make sense. On the other hand, men, that is so you in that picture. Oh, yeah. On the Especially pie that side. that one, the nothing box. There is a nothing box. We talk about boxes, we talk about waffles, but I like that. See how neatly the pie is cut. And there's even a little piece of paper in between. So a man functions one slice at a time. And we eat spaghetti. I mean, just in that picture, that should help you to remember why it is so hard for a, here it is, for a man. Now say a guy is working on one piece of pie. He's eating one piece of pie. And the women wonder, well, where am I in the picture? And he says, no, it's not about you. It's the p thing that I'm doing now. And we think, why can it not be about me? Why can you just be in one box at a time? If you do one thing, you don't think of all the other things. Okay? So that is why a man functions in, 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 in order. And a man, for the most part, likes order. He doesn't always bring order, but he likes order. And he likes to be left alone in his segregated little life. So... Now, now we have a problem. So what is, what is the Bible say? God is now saying, you, if you're a man or a woman, okay, but say you're the spaghetti person, you, uh, you are on, on, the, on that side where the spaghetti is. Now God is saying, now you have to submit to the man. You see how that doesn't even make sense? See why that is so hard? But that is what I'm called to do. I am called to submit to the way he functions and the way he thinks. On the other hand... God he, is a God of order. Yes. <laughs> and on the other hand, he is called to love the spaghetti. You know what, guys? If you can just fall in love with the spaghetti, life will be so easy. Don't try to understand it. For goodness sakes, do not try to fix it. Because it's messy. The more you try to fix the spaghetti, the more messy it gets. You just have to love it and treasure it and just learn to love to eat spaghetti and handle the mess. And girls, we just have to submit 
and be okay with eating one slice of pie at a time. I mean, just, the, just mentioning it is boring to me. One slice of pie, how many people eat one slice of pie? I eat a slice of pie and then I take the fork and I go a little piece of the next slice. How many of you have done that? You just, you just, and the, yeah, no, so you that is just... some of my pie on my plate. Right, right, so here we go, and this is what God has shown me in my life. This was to me a huge revelation that I'm not to fix him, he's not to fix me, but I have to understand him, and ultimately, I am responsible for my part. My part, which is, as a woman, I have to love him, I have to submit to his way of thinking. I remember and his Pastor way of Jim, uh, you know, he mentioned the other day, he said, you know, he fell in love with that part of Pastor Deborah. That he said, that's, that's the funny part that he just fell in love with. And that's, I think, what we men have to learn to do is just fall in love with the spaghetti and just learn to eat some spaghetti. It's okay. Yeah, and it took you how many years? Oh, forever. Yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> Took us seriously. It took us a long time, a lot of, and it seems simple, and it's, but it 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 truly um, took us a long time for me. It took me a long time to learn this and to get a grip on this and to flow with how my husband was created and to submit myself to him. So, um, I how's our time? Do you want to go with the next piece? Maybe just the last point. Okay, let me share with you. How do you do that? How in the world do you do that? I've got a couple things here that I can tell you as girls. It's gonna cost you, for guys and the girls, it's gonna cost pain, it's gonna cost a lot of dying, and it's gonna cost a lot of work. But here we go, short and sweet. For the women, put God first. Listen, if God wasn't first in my life, I would no longer be with this man. I just won't, not because of him, but because of me. If you think about that when Eve was created, who was the first man she ever saw? Think about that. Is that maybe why Adam had to sleep? I mean, God took Eve and took her over to him, and he was asleep when she was created, right? So there's a longing in our heart. I mean, girls, no man can fill the void in your heart that God can fill. So you have to, you have, if God is not number one really, then everything else is not going to fall into place. So really for real, you need to put God number one and not put all that pressure on your husband to act like God. We sometimes expect him to act like God and God to act like our husband. But we have to put God first. Secondly, See your husband as God's son. That was the aha moment in my life. I will remember the day when God spoke to me. I was complaining to God about my husband. Girls, can you raise your hand or you want to sit real still? Yes, I saw a hand go up there. Um, I was complaining to God about my husband. He's doing this and he's doing, God, I don't understand him. And God spoke a word to me and he said to me, he is my son and I love him. It just shocked me from the inside out. And I realized I cannot treat this man any which way I like. I have to treat him knowing that God is passionate about him, that he belongs to God. And then the last thing, let your husband be the first recipient of all your gifts and talents and strengths. We don't have time to look at the word help meet in Genesis when God created a help meet. That word help really means bringing strength as in an in a army, a force of an army. Also the same word that says God is my helper. It's a very, very strong word. Where girls, ladies, where do you apply your strengths, your talents, and your gifts? Is it with your children? Is it with your grandchildren? Is it in your workplace? Where is this God's calling is that that needs to go to your husband? Your husband should be the first recipient, the first line of, of receiving line of the strengths and talents in your life. And that it, then you become one. And when you add your strength to your husband, then that is a winning team according to God. Here's for the guys. God first. Again, you will never understand us. You will never get us. You will never be able to fix us. 
but you can surely love us. And the only way you're going to do that, our spaghetti brains, and you're going to love us, is when you put God first, because then God enables you. Here is the second thing I want to tell the guys. Listen, remember, if you remember one thing I say tonight, the second point for men, dance with your wife. Do you know what I mean by that? Dance with her physically, spiritually, dance with your wife. As I'm thinking about this, this is what a wife wants. She wants to be led. She wants to submit to your steps. But don't yell at her from across the room. Okay? Come up close. Nurture her. Cover her. Treasure her. And you will find that she is submitting to your lead in this dance called life. We did so, that the other day. Before breakfast. There was some music on and... Um, it was like a nice song. And so I said, grab the moment. Let's just dance. And, and the, kids, just dance. the kids disappear. Yeah, they like, and they just kind of, oh, yeah. this is it's a little like, weird. Okay. It's yeah. okay. But you know, if you see that as a relationship between the husband and wife, and the guys just approach your wife, now emotionally also, not just spiritually, uh, physically. Do you guys know what I mean by that? You are, okay, you are silent. Guys, do you know what I mean when I say dance with your wife? Not just in the physical, but in an emotional sense also. Be close to her, approach her, lead from up close, not yell at her from a distance, and you will see her heart change. And for goodness sakes, lastly, guys, be gentle. Be gentle, and these are things that I've seen in my husband's life that he also had to learn. He had to learn to be gentle with me. He had to learn that I break easily. So um, be gentle with your wives because they are fragile and they break easily. And um, these things are some of the things that we've learned. And again, it's taken a lot of tears, a lot of hard work. A lot of patience, a lot of long suffering, a lot of power of God working in us to get to the point where I can really submit to Him, submit myself to Him, and where He can really fall in love with every piece of me, even Praise my um, inconsistencies. Praise the Lord. Great job, baby. You look so gorgeous tonight. I just fall all over in love with you. You need again. to look here. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, um, I have very little time left, so I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I have a pastor's heart. I cannot help it, but just talk to you from the perspective of a pastor. I care about your eternity. I care about your future. I really want for you to succeed the way God wants for you to succeed. God loves you with such a passion. Do you know that? Do you know that God loves you? Tell somebody there next to you, He loves you. More than you can ever imagine, He loves you. He wants the best for you. And if I have to just pick two things quickly that, because really we can write volumes about what God has done for us in our relationship and our marriage through the years. But there's a couple of things that I ask God, what do I say? I have a few minutes to say, well, what do I say? And God showed me two things that I need to share with you. And I think the first thing is that you need to understand the bigger picture. You know, even this whole marriage series, there's a bigger picture that God would want for you to see. If you look in scripture, Everywhere in scripture you see uh, there's, there's uh, uh, talking about a marriage and a, and a wedding and hey, wouldn't you know it, we are getting ready for the biggest marriage ceremony ever, amen? How, how many of you are ready for that big celebration waiting for us in heaven? Boy, can you imagine what kind of a celebration that is going to be? All the years that Christ had to go and prepare a place for us so that we can be with Him forever. That's, that's the bigger picture. Sometimes we can get so bogged down with the small things in life. You know, this relationship right here just between us, and we miss the bigger picture. And the big picture, when you look at it, you see in Scripture, um, Revelation 19.7. Um, 
as they put up the scripture there, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. And that's the key that I want for you to, every single one of you in this room tonight, God wants you to be ready to be the bride of Christ. So everything here on earth, I've learned, everything on earth is kind of a, just a picture of someday eternity with God. And the whole thing about marriage, everything that we're supposed to learn in this marriage series is just there to prepare us for a relationship with Jesus, the Lamb that is going to be the groom someday and we're going to be the bride. Can I get an amen? amen? So scripture is very clear. All of us, we need to get ready. We need to prepare ourselves because if you don't, you may not enter into the kingdom of God. Pastor, where do you see that? Matthew 25. Matthew 25 verse 1 says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet who? The bridegroom. The bridegroom. So again, the picture of the marriage, of the big marriage that's coming. And so very clear, clearly scripture tells us that of the ten, that all of them are waiting, all of them, you know, they, they, they represent all the Christians that think that someday they're going to be in heaven and they're going to be the bride of Christ. But according to scripture, if you read the whole of Matthew 25, that, that section, it's, it, it tells you that half of them weren't really ready. They weren't ready. They thought they were ready, but when the moment came, they weren't. Their hearts were not ready. Scripture says they didn't have enough oil, and all of a sudden they're trying to get some oil. Why? What is the oil there for? The oil is there for to shine the light. Without oil, the, the lamp is not going to burn, and there's going to be no light. God wants you and me to really be able to shine the light and to be the light of the world. And, and so um, all of this is relevant to our relationship someday with God. And I, I think that includes every single one of us in this room. It's not just for married couples that we talk about when we talk through this uh, marriage series. We all need to learn about loving. We all need to learn about caring and honor and respect. We need to learn that right here, right now. We have this little bit of time here on earth to get ready. So learning to love is really, for me, what it's all about. We really need to learn to love. Uh, and so the first point for me is, is don't get bogged down in the, in the small detail and the little things. Understand the bigger picture. There's a bigger picture for all of us. There's a bigger picture, and that is that all of us are getting ready for this great marriage with a lamb someday. Secondly, as we talk about loving, you know, having the love of God inside of us, that's what we're supposed to get prepared for. We are preparing ourselves to be the bride, amen? Um, how do we do that? You know, um, because that's really your testimony. That's really my testimony that we're supposed to have. Uh, as a pastor, many times I, I have to uh, do funerals and um, it's amazing to me so many times um, the thing that mostly stand out for people, family members, when I try to say something nice about the person that is deceased, I say, this person just had such a loving heart, you know. What, what stands out for them is that loving character that they had. And then you get to some funerals where there's just nothing that you said. You know, and you just know. You just know, oh boy, this person was probably the feisty one in the family. The one that, um, that was really hard to uh, relate with, uh, tough to deal with. And so there's not really much to say about this person. You see, God wants for all of us someday to have 
a testimony. A testimony that we've, we've accepted the love of God and we are able to take that love and reflect it to those around us. And especially for those that we're married to. Especially those that are closest to us. For us to be able to love the way Christ loved the church. See, um, in the word testimony, and I'll, I'll uh, close with this. In the word testimony, you'll find the word test. And boy, have we been through some tests as a couple. When those pressures come in life, and there are many of them that will come for all of us, it's those pressures that really reveal what is on the inside of your heart. And uh, I remember the kind of pressures that we went through as a couple. We, um, we, as a matter of fact, I think we did four international moves in our life. You know what that means, an international move? It means you just get rid of everything and you just get on the plane and you go somewhere and start all over. You think that puts some pressure on you as a couple? Believe me, good for you. Uh, I'm counting four because for me, coming from the East Coast all the way here, that was like an international move, okay? Uh, because that's really what we did. We just got rid of everything, start all over again. Financially, many times, there was some real pressure. When I was in the hospital for three months, you know, I was burned all over my body. 75% of my body was burned. Talk about pressure on my dear wife. And what I need for you guys to understand, when you go through those pressures and those tests, boy, your relationship really need to be strong to survive that. I've seen so many couples, after they come through a real time of pressure and test, they just fall apart. They just can't handle that kind of stress. So how do you, how do you get through that? How, you, how do you do that? The only way to do that is to really be in the will of God all the time. To make sure, like Pastor Jim always also says, you know, um, if, if you're not going to be in the will of God, if you don't know that you know that you're in God's will, you know, the very first time that we came to the United States, we were born and raised in South Africa, for those of you that don't know. Um, when we came here, boy, God spoke to me very clearly. He didn't speak to her yet. Uh, I needed to make sure that God speak to my wife also. I, I, uh, I knew as much that I'm not going to try to force her just to do what I feel God has told me. I'm going to make sure that God speak to her also so that we can be in agreement. And you know, when you're in agreement and then stuff happens, then you'll walk through it in peace. That's when I was burned. I went through all that stuff in the hospital. And my wife and I, as much pressure as we had on us, we knew we were in the will of God. And because we were in the will of God, we can handle yeah. all that pressure. And we can come out victorious on the other end. Amen? That's very key for you to understand. And for you young people, listen, for those of you who are still thinking about marriage, you know, we met each other physically in the church. That's a good thing for you to do. Find your spouse busy serving God. If you want to be successful, I tell you, that will put you ahead a little bit. If you can just look for that. Don't look at the looks. You'll miss it. Look at the heart. You can look at the heart and understand who this person really is. That'll help you so much. There's enough pressure, enough tests that'll come in life. Try to find somebody that can serve God with you. That'll help you a lot to be successful in your relationship. So um, my time is up, but here's the thing. Okay? First of all, try to understand marriage. It's not just about your relationship with your spouse. So, so much more than that. It's about you understanding God is busy preparing. You are in this relationship. Boy, and how, how different we are. We are so different. 
as, as different as we are, God put us together and God wants us to learn to love, learn to forgive, learn to respect, learn to honor one another the way he care about us, how to be faithful. That's what God wants us to learn. And so if you see the bigger picture that God is really just preparing you for someday, your relationship with the big groom, you, are the, you and me are the bride of Christ, and someday we'll all be together in heaven, and we'll enjoy that big wedding feast. And right now, we're, we're learning about this thing called relationships and loving and caring about each other. See that and understand that. And secondly, make sure your testimony is a testimony that is filled with the love of God. People will be able to someday say, this man was filled with the love of God. How do you know, by the way, that uh, you really have a loving heart? I'll give you a quick test. Is that okay? How many of you want a quick test? To know that you have the love of God in your heart. <laughs> Watch little kids around you. You know, kids are so innocent. They can't lie. When you see those little kids and they run up to you and, you know, they have no problem being around you, <laughs> You have a loving heart. But when they kind of shy away from you, they see you as the grumpy one. They see you as the one that they're kind of scared of. Hey, you better start working in your heart. I, I, I just love my grandsons. I have two grandsons. It's the most wonderful thing for me to just have a good relationship with the one that now already, you know, know me well. And, Boy, that little boy, he runs up to me. He loves his grandpa. I worked on that relationship. From the beginning, I wanted that to be a good, godly, loving relationship. Someday, I know, if I lay my head down, I know that little boy will miss his grandpa because he knows how much I've loved him. And he loves me. God wants you and me to have loving hearts. And that counts for your spouse especially but for all the people around you, because all of us are getting ready for that big wedding feast. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now listen. I don't want you to just leave, walk out of here tonight and you're hurting in your heart. How many of you are married here in the house tonight? Let me see. Well, a number of you. You know, it's Christmas time. God wants you to be blessed. Maybe tonight, He wants you to walk out with the biggest gift that you can ever receive this Christmas. How about the gift of really feeling loved? The gift of really knowing there's forgiveness between you and your spouse. So I'm going to challenge you right here, right now. I'm going to ask you, if you know there's some stuff going on in your relationship between you and your spouse, why don't you just, why don't you just respond and let God do a miracle for you tonight in your relationship. Tonight is your night. You didn't come here just by chance. I believe this is an appointment that God has with you. So every couple that's here, Maybe you just need to squeeze each other's hand if you say, yeah, let's, let's do that. You feel the pressures. You know, maybe it's financial pressures. Whatever kind of pressure it is that you're feeling the, the squeeze and, and boy, your relationship, you know is not what God would want it to be. If it comes tonight, maybe you know that you will not find that your relationship is as godly as it should be. Come on up quickly. I want to pray for you right now. Come up here to this altar. Anybody? Come on up. Come on up. Yeah. Everybody just stand. Everybody just stand. We're going to pray. Just take a minute and just pray for these couples. I mean, this is, this is God's house. We're God's family. And God is here tonight to touch your hearts and help you to grow and walk out of here different than what you came in. Come on up. Come on up. It's your night tonight.
God wants to restore some stuff in your hearts. We're going to help you with that. My wife will be here and we'll, we'll help you. We'll pray over you and we'll do a couple of things that will help you just quickly. Okay? Anybody else? Come on up. Don't let the devil tell you, ah, oh, we're, we're okay. He wants to rob you. Don't let him rob you. Come up and receive what God has for you. Come quickly. Anybody else? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can come. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, how he loves you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants to bless you more than you can ever imagine. So now listen. If your spouse is right next to you, would you do something for me? I want you to just turn towards each other and, you know, just look at each other for a second there. I want you to do something really godly, okay? I want you to take a moment and say to each other, you know, just, just repeat these words after me. We call it the reset around here. Just do what the Bible tells us to do anyway, okay? It says, um, if I've hurt you in any way, would you please forgive me? Huh? For that I'm sorry. And would you please forgive me? Just say that to each other. Take turns and say that to, to each other. And then you can give each other a hug. Only God can help you to really be able to forgive. You can't forgive in your own strength. It's, the, it's God that enables you to let it go. Just look at each other and say, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. I love you. I want to love you the way God loves you. While you're talking to each other, all the wives, we learned tonight that it's God's will that you bring your strengths, your gifts, your talents, all of the giftings that God has gifted you as a woman with so amazingly. It's God's will that you attach yourself to your husband and bring that to his life. And if you haven't done that in your marriage, tonight is the night that you can make that commitment. So ladies, just talk to your husband just for a moment and tell him that it's your desire to be the godly wife and that you are deciding tonight you are bringing your strength and your gifting all to him to be the wife that God has created to stand next to your husband. Why don't you just talk to them about that? Tell him, I'm going to support you you are my first line, first recipient of my giftings and talents. Guys, listen to me just for a second. I didn't have time to get into this, but I'll just quickly tell you. At the Last Supper, we see the picture of what love really looks like. Jesus bowed down washed his disciples' feet. He served them. He loved them. Husbands, stop being full of pride. Start serving the way Christ served his disciples and loved them. Tell your wife next to you, I'm going to do better at serving you. I'm going to do the best I can to serve you and love you the way Christ gave me that example. Would you just tell her quickly? And then we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask the whole congregation just to extend your hands out towards the front here as we pray over all these couples. Father, I thank you for tonight. And tonight, Lord, as every one of these couples come here at the altar, Lord, they've come to you. 
their help. You're the one that can help them. You're an ever-present help in times of trouble. And I don't know all the stuff that they've been going through, but Lord, you know. As a pastor, I pray for them. I pray that you strengthen them. I pray that you will help them to overcome the evil one that wanted to rob from them all the blessings that you have for them as married couples. Strengthen them, Lord, in their relationship. Fill them with your love like only you can fill them, Father. Lord, we're looking forward to great testimonies of couples that are just, they're just going to fall more and more in love than ever before. We ask it, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of us shout together, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praise. Thank you, guys. You can go back to your seats. What's most important is for you to be sure where are you heading when you walk out of here tonight? If your heart should stop, God forbid, just like that, bam, that's it. Your end of life here on earth. Where will you open your eyes? Will you open your eyes in heaven or will you open your eyes in hell? You see, hell is a very real place. It's all over in scripture. Jesus talks about hell. Don't think hell is not a real place. It's very real. As a matter of fact, somebody that's been burned over 75% of his body, I can tell you there's one place I don't want to be, and that's hell. Hell is no joke. And it's time for us to make sure God would want for you to be sure, for you to be able to sleep peacefully tonight, knowing where you're going. And so that's the question for you tonight. And I want you to answer that question right there in your heart. It's between you and God. Now, some of you may have answered and said, Pastor, I think if I die, I think I'll go to heaven. Some of you may even say, I hope I will go to heaven. I have to tell you the truth. You know, I love you, care about you enough to just tell you the truth. Nowhere in the Bible can you find we can just hope that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to go to heaven. Or that you think that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to go to heaven. Nowhere in scripture can you find that. Some of you may say, well, pastor, um, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. You know, my mom and dad took me to catechism classes, Sunday school classes. You know, we have a cross, uh, St. Christopher, you know, uh, on the walls, or, you know, we wear it, and we really see ourselves as Christians. We're not Buddhist or Hindus or any other religion. We're Christians. I mean, hey, we're in America. Americans are a Christian nation, right? <laughs> so wrong. Show me anywhere in the scripture where you just go to church, where you just go, uh, you know, uh, call yourself a Christian and that you're a Christian. Nowhere in scripture can you find that. Pastor, you don't know me. Um, you know, I, I really have been, uh, in my last church, um, I was part of the uh, leadership team. Um, I was part of the uh, people that prayed for people. I did all kinds of stuff in that church. I even carried the pastor's Bible. I mean, I, I did some great stuff. As a matter of fact, I always brought my offerings, my tithes. You know, I've, I've done my share of what I thought I needed to do to be a good person and do the things that I think is right. Show me in scripture where, you know, you just live a certain way and uh, that will just automatically mean that you're going to go to heaven someday. Like God is going to come and pat you on the back and say, ah, good job, you, you've lived a good life, you can go into heaven. You haven't robbed the 7-Eleven here lately or nothing like that, you know. You, you're a good person. You're okay. As a matter of fact, we see in scripture, Jesus come to a man by the name of Nicodemus in John the third chapter. And if there ever was a good man, Nicodemus was a great man. Nicodemus, um, he knew the scripture inside out. 
He gave his money to the poor. He cared about others. And when he talked to Jesus about eternity, Jesus didn't pat him on the back and say, Hey, Nicodemus, don't worry. Listen, you're a good person. Heaven is waiting for you. He didn't. What did he do? He looked at Nicodemus and he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can go to God's heaven is God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And this is what Jesus said. You must be born again. So tonight, I want to give you that opportunity to make a decision for Jesus and to be born again. What does that mean, Pastor? What does it mean to be born again? It means that you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's really what it means. You see, in, uh, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I'm coming again. And when I come, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what was he really saying? He's saying, I hate it when somebody's lukewarm. You know, a little in, a little out, halfway in church, halfway in the world, you know, doing some of God thing and doing some of your own thing again. That, that's what lukewarm is all about. Well, we've been talking about marriage. Can you imagine being married to somebody that's just lukewarm in their relationship with you? You know, have, loving you one day and then trying to love somebody else another day and you know, everything is just cool. Can you imagine that? God hates that. And that's why Jesus said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, I will expel you out of my body and you don't belong there. Tonight, why don't you make a decision to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. We should do this if you've never done this. Tonight's your night. Why don't you give him tonight all of your heart and all of your life. If you're not sure, tonight, Take the opportunity. Make sure. Walk out of here. Sure where you're going to go. We want to help you with that. So are you ready? I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three. Just pop my hand together like that. And then you just raise your hand. We're going to all do it at the same time. Is that okay? All do it at the same time. Pastor, you know, uh, I know about Jesus. Uh, I mean, I... Uh, I when you talk about Jesus, I've, I've heard this stuff all my life. Have you given him all of your heart? It's not what's in your head, what counts. It's what's in your heart that counts. And your heart, once you've made a decision to give him all of your heart and all of your life, the way you live your life will show that. Why don't you make sure tonight? Why don't you be born again tonight? Are you ready? Here it is. If you're not sure, make sure. If you've never done this, tonight's your night. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Anybody? Anybody? This is your night. Anybody? You ready? Tonight's your night. God, I want to make sure. I want to go to heaven, not go to hell. Anybody? see a hand come on God loves you he wants the best for you anybody praise God all right I know there's a couple of you. There's a couple of you that God is speaking to you. He's tugging at your heartstrings. You feel right there by yourself, you're saying, I wish this pastor would just shut up, just shut it down. For your sake, 
I'm not. I care enough about you. Just give you a moment to respond. Is there anybody? Let me see your hand. I see that hand, thank you. I know there's more than one. Just, just don't clap, just don't clap. I know there's more than one. Where? I see that hand, thank you, thank you. Praise God, hallelujah. All right, let's stand and let's thank God for two wise people in the house. I knew there was at least two. Thank God for those of you that responded. Tonight's your night. Now there's some of you, you think, oh, wow, I, I got out of this one. You know God is still tugging at your heart. You know God's still speaking to you. Please don't walk out of here tonight and just say, ah, oh, you know, maybe another time. How do you know that you will have a tomorrow? None of us are guaranteed that. Why don't you just get ready for a great Christmas with the love of God flooding your heart tonight? So I'm going to ask those that raised your hand, want you to come, just uh, bring all your stuff. Bring a friend. If you need a friend, just let them come and, and meet me in the front here. And those of you that also should have responded, you know that God spoke to you. Come on up quickly. We're going to welcome you as you come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else? You should have responded. You know God spoke to you. Come on up. Come on up. Tonight's your light. Great decision, best decision of your life. So glad you guys did this. Now listen, um, we're gonna do three things real quick, all right? Over here on your left is Pastor Joel. Great guy, I mean, I'm as weird as it gets. He's a great guy. He's gonna do three things. He's gonna pray with you. He's gonna give you some free stuff to take home. And he's gonna tell you about a program that we have here you know, of you meeting some friends that'll help you to grow in the things of God. And he'll explain all of that real quick. So if you just take a left turn and follow Pastor Joel, praise God, thank you for being obedient. God bless you. Amen, amen. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words, say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.